Welcome to FinTech, Shaping the Future of the World of Finance. And happy spring. It's May. I thought, what the heck, you've got to be a little innovative. Try teaching from outdoors. So this is uh, not a virtual background. Uh, if, the, uh, if the sun is too much or the, the birds are too much, that's an additional thing Romaine can give me advice on. Now today we're gonna to dive into insurance and technology or what some call this little sector of FinTech as insure tech, but it's not so little and it's not just simply because the excitement is around payments and challenger banks and apps like Robinhood and the capital markets and so forth that we leave insure tech to the end. I also think insure tech is an interesting field that it brings all the pieces together in some way. It brings together a part of finance that has big legacy incumbents. In every country we, we're in, there's this handful of life insurance companies and property and casualty insurance. That's those that offer lines of insurance on our homes, our autos and so forth. Healthcare insurers, particularly in those countries that have, uh, uh, like the US, big open healthcare systems. These insurance companies, big legacy companies have tended to be a little behind the curve of technology compared to the Wall Street firms. Not a lot behind, but a little behind. And then the insure tech itself, the fintech within insure, insurance, has done some really interesting things, particularly around alternative data. And we're going to dive into some of these uh, opportunities. And also, uh, they're, they're a little bit uh, uh, new forms of alternative data. It's not just about our credit rating. It's about our driving. It's about our homes. It's about thinking about can we underwrite insurance risk related to how we live our lives, how we drive our cars, how small businesses are operated, and whether there's more information that can be brought to bear on not just financial inclusion, but the pricing and underwriting of risk. Um, of course, we're gonna see the same trends about artificial intelligence, we're gonna see some really important trends around user interfaces. And one of the most interesting areas around user interfaces is what's called claims management, an area that, you know, hopefully you don't have to think about too much, but amongst this class of 80 or more, I'm sure that somebody's had a little fender bender, had some scrape up on the roads. And now that there are apps that you can just on your mobile phone, take some quick photographs and put it right into the system. Claims management is changing quite a bit now as well. And there's startups in this space that basically say, we will get you better claims management, faster, smoother, and a better user experience about claims management. So with that, I'm gonna to try to um, um, upload the slides again. Uh, if we can join sort of the community together, uh, sort of videos on, uh, please raise your hands actively. Romaine's gonna be watching uh, for any blue hands up also in the chat. And uh, if the birds get to be too much, just know that I'll go back in on inside on Wednesday. Romaine, how is it so far? It's fine, it's very nice, don't worry. All right, all right. He's He's assuring me that I can keep having a little bit of, uh, of in, indulgence here uh, in this uh, beautiful outdoor setting. And uh, what I'm gonna need to do is go to this share screens. So we're gonna talk a little bit, we're gonna start a little bit about the insurance value chain and the sector's landscape now. And traditionally in business schools, traditionally in worlds of finance and finance majors, there's a lot of time spent on banking and on capital markets. And there's some time, but less time spent on insurance. 
And uh, so I'm gonna just lay the groundwork a little bit about insurance, some of the challenges in the sector itself, and then get into this field, FinTech and insurance, or what a lot of people call insure tech opportunities, business models, and the startups. So that's sort of the goal of the class. The readings uh, were really about this area of insure tech. There was a, a, a handful of them. The Bank of International Settlement reading was really talking about some of the regulatory challenges and whether insure tech is, will change some of the risks in terms of regulating this space. And then a little reading about Asia and if you've not had the opportunity to look at some of the readings because they were just put up last Friday, uh, go back, it, sort of dive in, take a, take a little look. Um, and again, we'll see if there's anybody who wants to give a little few in this field, but what opportunities in the current insurance sector, or what are the pain points you think that you might wanna highlight um, and, and again, this is just to get a little conversation going. So, Romain. Okay, here we go. Who will be our first volunteer for today? Has anybody ever had insurance and felt there was a little pain point? Michael, I see a hand up. As always, Michael is helping us out to get us started. Let's go ahead. Yeah, um, I think one of the kind of the obvious ones is just processing time. It's just really kind of through each step of the process, underwriting, I don't know, processing, claims management, it's just, it just takes a long time. So kind of there's definitely a lot of opportunities for automatic feedback or leveraging AI to really speed that up for consumers. All right. So, so let's, the, the two sides of processing, it's the front end when you're actually trying to get your insurance when you're actually, it's called underwriting, the insurance company is pricing and giving you availability of insurance. And whether it's life insurance, where you might have to send in some medical tests and the like, homeowner's insurance, renter's insurance, auto insurance, where there's a process going on at the front end. And, and then there's also the process if you have an accident. Insurance is this product that basically if you never hear from your insurance company and you, they never hear from you, you've paid a premium to protect you against a risk, but the risk has not generated a loss. But then you have the accident. Then you have the problem. Then you have to send in a claim. And that process and the back end, the insurance companies want to protect against fraud. They want to fulfill your claim, but they want to protect against fraud. And the claim adjustment process is a significant time and human and paper-based and sometimes legal-based circumstance. So Michael, you're right, pain points at the front end, particular pain points in the claims processing side. Um, anything else you wanna throw in? Um, I guess- uh, Oh, we've got from, two other hands oh, if you want. I mean, if you, uh, yeah. you wanna- That's fine. Uh, um, I'm gonna pass it off to somebody else. Alessandro? Yeah, I think uh, another big trend is gonna we're gonna see different type of insurances um, come to life. There is more and more risks are becoming quantifiable, and this leads to a number of events or things we can get an insurance on. So the the selection of things on which we can get insured is going to increase dramatically because the, the the quantifiable risks are getting bigger and bigger. Right. And sometimes it's not just a new risk in society, but it's as, as Alexandra is saying, the quantifiability of it. So let's take auto insurance and a company that started a number of years ago called Metro Mile. It's a simple concept. What if we charged insurance, automobile insurance, not by the month, but maybe by the mile? Could we quantify that you've only driven a mile and that would be the insurance. And if you're a heavy driver, there's more. And in fact, what if the mile is out on the country roads or it's actually in the cities and where you're driving? So quantifiability, the analytics, the computer capability, but also the connections to all of us with sensors and the internet of things. Um, so 
I've sort of given a little bit of a preview, but there were some other hands up. How have that which we've talked about all semester, machine learning, alternative data, uh, influenced this, but a new factor that we've really not talked much about in banking and challenger banks and payment systems is the Internet of Thing devices, possibly changing the field of insurance. Danielle, would you like to go? Sure, um, and also you just broke up there, so if you lose me, sorry about my internet connection. Um, so there's an opportunity for the insurance landscape to be changed by alternative data in that companies can now inform their underwriting process with a lot more information, a lot richer set of data than they previously had. So whereas for health insurance or life insurance, you might have had to fill out a survey. People are varying degrees of honest on those kinds of surveys. Um, now we're suddenly generating an extremely ac accurate picture of ourselves uh, almost passively by everything we do in the world and companies can access that information. Right, or can they access it? They still have to have a network. And what's really interesting in this space is that just as we saw data aggregation, an important feature uh, in the payment space with companies like Plaid and Galileo and everything that they were, they were right there collecting data between the banks and the payment systems and then uh, hundreds or thousands of fintech startups that there were data aggregators in the middle, there are data aggregators in this field as well to collect that data, commercialize the data, but maybe stand between our lives and all the sensors and data collection efforts and hundreds or thousands of startups on the other side as well. Um, Nikhil? Sure. I think this is more specific to the uh, health insurance side of things, um, where a lot of times in health insurance claims, 90% of claims are auto adjudicated and most of them are based on like statistical methods. With the influx of AI, like you can review claims that you weren't reviewing before. And so you could potentially uncover more fraud, waste and abuse than you were. Um, so this is like a market that they haven't sized yet because they don't know how big fraud might be. Um, so I think there's a big trend there as well. Great, great point. And sometimes it's not truly artificial intelligence or machine learning. It's just the remarkable ability to collect, sort, clean up the data, standardize the data that might also have a bit of machine learning on top of it. But it doesn't have to be the machine learning. It's, it's sort of this partnering up. And then what are some of the challenges? We're going to talk about some of the challenges for the startups trying to get in there, capital, regulation. And does anybody have a view as to date, to the date why we haven't seen, uh, with some important exceptions, but we haven't seen big tech firms getting engaged in the insurance field? Now, there's some important exceptions we'll talk about in China, by the way, but... Um, why we haven't seen Amazon, they're in the credit card space and Apple and, and payment space, but why we haven't seen big, big uh, tech by and large. Lyra? Yeah, um, so I just think that it's mostly because there's a lot of um, barriers to entry, namely like, as you mentioned, regulation and also lack of expertise, which all of these insurance companies already have. So. I think it's also a regulation and high cost because of lack of expertise that prevents these big tech firms from entering into the insurance market. All right. So I think that's partly right, but I'm also going to put out the question throughout the class and as your thought experience at the end, well, is it just that we haven't gotten there yet? Is it possibility that, that again, big tech is about data, networks, and activities as the Bank of International Settlement has written? And so do they want to layer another activity upon that network, upon that network? We haven't quite seen it. I said that with one important exception in China, in China, a number of years ago, big tech, Alibaba, Tencent, as WeChat, partnered up with one of the largest insurance companies in China, and the three of them started effectively an insure tech. It's the world's largest insure tech, if you, we still call it that. And it was an owned, owned and operated by three big, very big companies, uh, 
Ping Ang was the insurance company. And so it wasn't direct, it was a joint venture, um, but it's a question of will we see this coming into the future or not? Um, so let's just sort of dive into the value chain. You've got to design a product, you've got to market it, it goes all the way to claims management. You can be in any one of these pieces. Uh, this is just pulled from the Federal Insurance Office of the US Department of Treasury from a report uh, last year. But each of these pieces might have a piece of competition and a pain point. We talked a little bit about claims management. That's claims management separates insurance from the banking fintech we've talked about, but a lot of the underwriting and the front end, designing a product and the marketing, you'll see that an awful lot of disruption is going on at that front end. Marketing is sales, it's brokerage, it's bringing in the customer, it's a better user interface, a better user experience. In the underwriting and rating side, you can underwrite credit, you can underwrite insurance. It's basically how much insurance will I provide, to whom, at what price? And, and that underwriting process ultimately comes to administering the policy and then the claims management side of it. So each of these pieces of the value chain might have pain points. The front, the front four of these designing products to policy administration actually has a lot of overlap with the banking sector. Um, not identical, important differences. Um, so what's the sector look like? I just list companies on these several next slides, life insurance, property and casualty. And what I want you to take out of it is not particular names in your country, whether it's China Life or Met Life or Nippon Life and, and, and Swiss Life, it's that if you look at when these companies were founded, many are 20th century, but many are actually 19th century. The, the concentration and the survival, the persistence of insurance companies is quite consistent around the globe. They talk about the big five in China, but in any country, in any country, there's a handful of insurance companies once you get to about the top 10, you're at 85 to 90 plus percent market share, particularly in life insurance and property and casualty. A little less so in some other fields. And there's of course health and managed care, more a feature of the US healthcare system where it's private insurance um, and then big diversified companies uh, across the globe. Diversified simply means that it's both in life and, and property and casualty and the like. So it's multi-line. Um, but let's not forget there's also reinsurance and then brokers. And the brokerage side is an area where disruptors have started to say, well, maybe we can broker insurance. And by brokering insurance is basically making the sales, making the marketing, but not taking the risk onto your own balance sheet. Benefits administration, software, the only companies that are 21st century companies on this whole sort of review is in the software and services side of things. So that's kind of my kind of, you know, overall point. US insurance premiums, just to give you a sense of scale of the market, about one and a half trillion dollars a year. We talk about the finance sector, that's about seven and a half trillion in the US, I'm sorry, Seven and a half percent, seven and a half percent of GDP, uh, overstatement there, which is about one and a half trillion. This is consistent with that size. These are the premiums being paid into uh, direct premiums written. Uh, the health and life side of things, just to give you a little flavor, and these will all be on Canvas, of course. By and large, a big part of the life and health side is so, set savings products. There's competition between life companies and banks, life companies and investment management companies on the annuity side. The disruption, so to speak, has been happening 
largely in property and casualty, but to the extent that insure tech starts to get into the space, I think you will see more and more disruption in the savings product side as well. The, the companies like Betterment and all those companies we talked about in the wealth management side or in wealth tech, I think you will see starting to say, wait, maybe we can get into the annuity side as well, the annuity and saving side of life insurance products. Property and casualty, just a little breakdown here in the US. And so now we turn to challenges, pain points. What do we have? This is true of any incumbent company. You could be a company that's been in business for 100 plus years and you're, you're sitting there going, I'm selling through an agent or broker network. And the agency and brokerage network here in the US takes a big chunk of fees. I think on the property casualty side, we're probably in the 10 to 13% of, of premiums on average, but in some products, it's much larger, some a little smaller. The life side, the premiums, I think, are in high single digits to 10% on average. And while I'm not sort of an expert of all the fee, that basically means if you pay $1,000 for your auto insurance, 100 plus dollars, $120 is being taken by those agents and brokers. Claims administration, we talked about it. Very paper and human intensive, litigation risk all abound. Um, insurance companies are built up around this. Legacy tech, just like in, in, in payments and in credit. Of every dollar of premium, a big chunk is not only going to the agents and the brokers, but a big chunk is going, of course, to the whole claims processing and the whole value chain. And because it's deeply regulated in many marketplaces, you can't offer a new type of insurance without getting some official sector approval. Going through the product design phase often has le legacy and time delays within it. And of course, just like the other fields, there's whole sorts of questions about user interface and user experience. All of these present challenges, but they also present opportunities. Romain, any questions? Not yet, but let's wait for perhaps a few seconds. No, I don't see any hands up. All right. So insurance and insurance tech. You can sort of say, I want to be involved in the pricing and underwriting, the quotes, the policy administration, the claims management, sort of four different sectors, improving the customer engagement, lowering operating costs. Look, of course, it always goes back to, can you do something better, quicker, cheaper? But as we talked about earlier, it could be in product design as well. It could be in, in not just doing it cheaper in pricing, but more availability. And as Metro Mile is done, really in using metrics to get to a new type of product itself and the quoting and issuing of products. So uh, what are some of the opportunities more specifically? I think across financial technology, it's about user interface and user experience. So that could be in the sales side, it can be in the account management, digital and mobile phones, but also in the conversational interface. Underwriting, we've talked about it, really not just the machine learning, but the alternative data. And then claims processing. I think these are the big three. They seem pretty simple once I say it, but it's sort of like, thinking about it, and if you have a business model, if you're going into this business, or you're at Prudential Life Insurance or Nippon Life, it's sort of saying, how can we use technology to enhance user experience? How can we enhance basically the pricing and the availability of our product called underwriting? How do we do the back end? The first two, user experience and underwriting, very much true in banking tech claims processing somewhat unique here. 
and it's about data capture. Um, now, one part of the data capture, and you can see it here, drones, the internet of things, smartphones, telematics, wearables. I, I'm curious, Romaine, you'll see if anyone will raise their hand. Does anybody actually take an insurance where the insurance company has said for your automobile, we want to have access to your driving record directly th through your car's telematics. Telematics is a word that didn't exist 30 and 50 years ago. It's really, or if it did exist, it wasn't commonly used. It's about all the information that your car is collecting on driving in the computers on board your, your car, and it's not just GPS, and it can sort of assess your driving. Smartphones as well can assess our driving because smartphones are not just locational devices, but they can get all this, the ups and downs of your driving. What does that mean? That between smartphones and the computers on our cars, a product can be offered that says, we know enough about your driving that we will give you fine-tuned pricing and underwriting. And you? Remain? Yeah, I had a question um, around the around Google's deal with Ascension to store and analyze the medical records from their hospital network. And I'm curious if you think um, that kind of entrance of big tech into the medical world is going to be more common and if that might be a potential avenue for those kinds of companies getting the insight into health data that they would need to make them competent to move into insurance. I think... Uh, you've landed upon one area that big, big tech can be very uh, influential, particularly the big AI companies like Google and Beidou in China. Uh, to the extent, and we'll see, there are some startups that are entering this field because they're very good at data analytics and machine learning. And to the extent that they can be data aggregators like Google, you're absolutely right. I don't think it's just healthcare, by the way, but I think healthcare is a really important piece of it. That many insurance companies, healthcare management companies in the US have a tremendous amount of data and they wanna make more sense of it. And they wanna, with that data, provide more fine-tuned insurance products, but also help manage our healthcare system uh, uh, better. So I think it is an avenue for certain big tech companies that are uh, at the cutting edge of, of data analytics and machine learning. Not for every uh, big tech company, but um, for many. I agree with that. Yeah. Did anybody have an insurance pro Did anybody take out an auto insurance? Uh, I think probably Alessandro. He had his hand up, but probably for yeah. that question. I had um, this little uh, chip or computer on board and um, basically, yeah, it um, traced everything that I did with the car, like where I, where, I, where I was, how many miles I drove, everything. And actually, it, it actually helped me to uh, decrease the cost of the insurance. There you go. There you go. Now, some of the first telematics patents filed uh, on telematics were in the late 1990s. But what we found is it's really changed the field of auto insurance. This little visualization about insure tech, again from the Department of Treasury study last fall, I think it's just a good place to, to pause for a second. We're not going to go through every box, but whether it's sensors and telematics, and this is a big piece of having those sensors and telematics there to lower Alexandro's cost of insurance, but also for claims management. If the telematics and sensors are there upon an accident, then you can lower a little bit the cost of claims management, and the insurance companies can have confidence the accident actually happened, potentially figure out who's at fault, see right at that moment 
what's going on in that automobile. Visual computing, literally downloading, uploading photographs into the claims management process. We've already talked about machine learning and AI, but blockchain technology I want to touch upon. Of all the fields of blockchain technology that we generally have heard about, and many of them are hype versus reality, one field is whether with the use of blockchain technology that we can have an append-only log that is tamper-resistant, whether there would be trust in a field of insurance called parametric insurance. In essence, if we had an automated smart contract that said that if this happens, I get paid. So what's the this? One field that a group of students studied last year, uh, studying it on behalf of uh, a, a group in Asia, was parametric insurance for airline delays. If you could embed on a, a, a tamper-resistant ledger, on that ledger you would embed smart contracts that says if the plane takes off more than a half hour late, you automatically get paid a mobile app, no trying to rely on the airlines whether they're accurately telling you or not that the plane took off late, put it on a blockchain technology. Now maybe you could do it with a central database as well, but there are many people looking to whether to use blockchain technology for parametric insurance. But the sensors and telematics, the visual computing, the machine learning, those are real. The Department of Treasury sort of also put something on the, on the edge in terms of blockchain technology. Challenges though abound for insure tech. There's still the age old challenge of funding. And it's, it's particularly true in insurance because if you take an insurance risk onto your balance sheet, that's a liability of an insurance company. That's a liability that in the future they have to pay out a claim on an accident, a loss on your home, or on your life. So many companies are finding challenges if they're startups, how can they access capital? Now in the banking sector, you can possibly do it through securitization. You can basically say, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna build my own balance sheet. I'm gonna sort of rent a balance sheet. I'm gonna lay it off. Similarly here, you can lay off some risk in the reinsurance markets, but it's not quite the same for these insure tech startups. Most challenger banks partner with some bank, get a warehouse line of credit, and possibly also then sell their loans after they're initiated. Here, it's not as robust, it's not as developed, but again, many insurance fintech startups are saying, do I partner with a big dominant insurance company because I can't build my balance sheet as rapidly? If you choose to be a carrier, and a carrier is the term to say that you actually take the insurance onto your balance sheet, you have the liability, choose to be a carrier, it's balance sheet intensive. Also, just how do you fund your startup run rate loss? Because all the startups tend to have multiple years of building out a network and building the platform itself. Clearly the competitive landscape, the regulatory frameworks, the regulatory frameworks, do you get licensed? Again, similar to the challenger banks. Remember we talked about there's neo banks and challenger banks, which often people sort of say uh, in, in the same breath are the same. But more specifically, a neobank is something doing a lot of banking functions that has not yet gotten a banking license. Similar here, if you're thinking about starting an insurance fintech firm, what type of licensing will you get? Will it just be a brokerage licensing? In various jurisdictions, you have to register to be a broker or an agent, or are you actually registering to take lines onto your balance sheet and become a carrier? And then, of course, user adoption and the use of data. And in terms of the use of data, there aren't quite the same laws. It doesn't, we, we have the same conceptual framework that you have to be fair and unbiased, but there aren't quite the same laws 
like the Equal Credit Opportunity Act here in the US. And in terms of the use of data, as we'll see in a minute, if you sign a waiver and say, you can use my driving record to give my insurance, as Alexandra did, they can use that data also on the claims management side. It's not just to lower the cost, it's also to see if you call up and say I had an accident, they look at the telematics and say, did this really happen? So the InsureTech landscape, we're not gonna dive into this slide, but it's just each of these pieces, each of these pieces, it might be that you're trying to go into the billing and payments, which is sort of rudimentary sort of, you could be going all the way to another area and say, we're gonna be the best data analytics on wearables. And by I mean wearables, how many people have a Fitbit? Does anybody wanna talk about whether you've signed up for insurance, uh, that your insurance company can get your data off of your Fitbit or off of your Apple Watch, off your, off, you know, what you're using for, in, for exercise can lower your cost of insurance. I'm gonna pause, remain. I don't see any hands up. Ah, Lindsay, go ahead. So I didn't have like the, the agreement straight with the insurance, but what I did have is that my former employer had a program where we would connect our uh, tracking devices, like for steps and stuff, uh, with this program that like would give you kickbacks if you got so many steps a day. Uh, so like I'd get tons of gift cards because of all the steps I tracked in. And that data, I'm sure, was going to the insurance company to lower right, the insurance right. rate. So if you got to your 10,000 steps, or maybe they gave you a premium for 5,000 steps, you got uh, some rewards. Now, we, know, we all know about rewards programs in credit cards, and that's part of that two and three quarter percent interchange fees. These rewards by your employer Ultimately, the economic incentives is the employer can have lower cost of health insurance. That data, through the intermediation of your employment contract, was lowering health insurance costs for some group health insurance. Now, I think your employer was also doing it because they know if you're in better health that you also have fewer days off, you'll be, you'll be hopefully a better employee. So they're also lowering some of their, their uh, costs in terms of their direct costs, but it also relates to health insurance. Um, so wearables, trackables, telematics, and the internet of thing. The internet of thing is a term, is about sensors. And it's about sensors in many items in our home as well. If you have a home security system, in the last five or 10 years, you've been, able to tie that into more data. Now, home security systems have for decades somehow had to communicate through a security company to law enforcement if the alarm went off. But I'm talking about more fine-tuned monitoring. And we all are aware, even though that very few of us might have it, that you can have apps on your phone that you could communicate with your home to turn on your heat or your air conditioning, monitor your home, home monitoring devices that makes all of us maybe more comfortable that our home is secure or even to have the communication from the home if for some reason there's a problem in the home. And there's sensors on refrigerators, there's sensors on HVAC, heating and ventilation systems. Uh, there are sensors throughout houses. The 2020s, we're going to see this just absolutely mushroom in terms of sensors. So what's that data do for the insurance field? That's why I think insure tech and insurance and, and fintech is such an exciting and interesting place because we are basically in a transformational time right now in terms of sensor technology and embedding sensors into our economies, not because of insurance, but because many users wanna sort of monitor either their home, their automobile, their wearable, their trackable, 
And now with this, this really challenging time around the coronavirus crisis, we're talking about contact tracing. And all that contact tracing could also be fed in, depending upon the jurisdiction, depending upon the regulation, into health insurance rates, life insurance rates, or any form of insurance. Again, largely dependent upon the various jurisdictions, regulatory and legal frameworks. So what are some of the possibilities? You can become a licensed insurer. That means actually committing balance sheet, becoming licensed, taking claims on as a liability, managing the asset side as well. You could be a managed general agent, think broker. It's just a term to say you could be managing agents or brokerage or sales. Those are kind of the two big divides, but you could just be on the technology side or the data aggregation side. These are the various models for insure tech. Some of the startups, we won't go through each one of them, but you're gonna see a common thing in these lists is by and large all founded in the 20 teens. So this is five or 10 years uh, of, of dynamic change. You're gonna see heavy emphasis on homeowners and autos. So it's in the consumer space, very similar to credit. You see a little bit moving into small business, but not large commercial lines. Though Bold Penguin is a commercial insurance exchange a lot is on the front end and on the auto side, you also get marketplace comparisons. Just like in the credit space, it's basically Expedia for auto insurance, so to speak, you could say, or Expedia for fill in the blank insurance. These are the marketplace comparisons like Coverhound and, and Goji, um, but throughout you'll see Home and auto, small business is kind of the dominant. How many, has anybody uh, used the product Lemonade for renter's insurance? Wow. I don't see any hands up. Nobody. So Lemonade got into the field basically to say, it, it's so many people, particularly in the US are renting and we just want some insurance uh, for our, our objects and our things in our homes and in case there's a problem. Or maybe the landlord says you have to have renter's insurance. Policy Bazaar. Policy Bazaar, about 12 years old, one of the largest marketplace comparison in India. It's a remarkable platform. Again, think broadly speaking, Expedia for health and life insurance. You know, where you can price compare policy bizarre. Uh, of these various companies, just pause a bit on Root. Root uses telematics to price their products. Almost every one of the auto companies on here are using telematics and smartphones, some of them started on telematics, some started more on the smartphone side, but the merger of those two. Tractable in the auto field is about claims management, just solely sort of focusing there. And I said I was gonna mention about China, the last on this list, and I probably will mispronounce how to say it, Zong'an. Um, was formed by three very large companies, online property and casualty in China. It's gone public since. It's a very significant company in China. It's the only online insurance company that it got licensing in China. So it chose to get licensing. It had the backing of three very large companies seven years ago. It got said licensing. <laughs> and it has a certain advantage that to my knowledge, I don't think anybody else, else has been there. So it gives you some of the smattering. I'm gonna pause Ravain to see if there's any questions. We good? 
I think we're good, Gary. Healthcare, healthcare, FinTech. I'd still call it insure tech. Some people can call it health tech. This is the insurance side and how technology is coming in to disrupt. Again, you could be in any piece of this. Uh, uh, I borrow this chart from FT Partners, but you could be in any piece of this and, and say, I'm gonna do the payment side, I'm gonna do the claim side, I'm gonna be in benefits management, but any piece of this. And so in the, again, most of these are in the US, but not all, just some of what we're seeing. American Well is about telehealth, a very important thing now that we're in, in a period of time that we can't visit our doctors in person. Again, you'll see most, not all of these are in the last 10 years. Clover, which is a unicorn, almost all of these, not all of these are unicorns, meaning worth over a billion dollars. Um, Clover is about taking our analytics about how we live our lives and trying to underwrite and lower the cost to us. Probably the largest ones are Bright Health, which is selling a Medicare Advantage is in the US on top of Medicare, which is government provided, you can, you can have an augmented program on top called Medicare Advantage. Um, Bright Health, Clover, Gusto. You'll see also there's a significant number of companies that have gotten into the benefit administration. This is working with small businesses to administer their benefits. Zetafits that was formed in 2013, by 2015, we actually use Zenefits on, a, on an effort I was involved with, was a CFO of the Hillary Clinton campaign. It was a two-year-old startup and we decided to go with benefits because we could outsource to this vendor our benefits administration for our startup. Now that startup ultimately proved unsuccessful, as you know, but over the course of time, 5,000 employees, all that benefit administration, the healthcare and so forth, and so forth, benefits. Health equities is in this field through health savings accounts. Health equities actually bought uh, in the last two years a company called WageWorks that I was at, I was, when WageWorks was a startup company, I went on their board and managed uh, uh, the hiring of a CFO and helped WageWork prepare to go public as a private company. As a FinTech years ago, Health Equities bought that company, WageWorks. Gusto is very significant in this field as well. So you have a sense, it's the marrying of finance and health. So it can be through the benefits and payroll administration side, which is finance or it can be directly marketplace comparisons like Go Health, which is similar to Policy Bazaar in India. All of these little subsectors and slices. Data related is sort of the last little slice. And this goes to the earlier question about Google and healthcare. While we haven't seen big tech there, I think that we're bound to because there's so many data analytic. Cambridge Mobile Telematics do not, please don't confuse with Cambridge Analytica, but Cambridge Mobile Telematics, you can see there are data aggregators that are collecting telematic data. They're not alone. And then with that data, commercializing it to insurance companies, big insurance companies as well as startups. Strong Arm Tech, one of, one of my favorites in this field. They're selling a product that in factories, if your factory workers will wear some wearable, not a Fitbit, some of it's like around the mid, mid uh, uh, chest range, but if they'll wear a sensor, you can lower the cost of workplace insurance. You can also hopefully make the workplace safer. So they're selling a safety device, injury protection, but it's about software and hardware because they're selling the wearables. 
and it's called strong arm tech. Will it be successful? It's been around nine years. So what you're seeing in insurance tech, which I think is so fascinating and potentially transformative, is a whole world of sensors and collecting alternative data, whether it's from our cars back to the telematics, whether it's from our, our watches or our wearables, our Fitbits, from our smartphones, from the sensors in our homes, all that can sort of collect data, a little bit of machine learning, not always deep machine learning, deep learning, but some machine learning, lower the costs, broaden the inclusion potentially, and then on the claims management side as well, sensor technology, collecting the data, lowering the fraud and, and the like. There's one firm that brags that they have the shortest claim uh, settlement period that an online app was able to get claim settlement down to less than minutes. And I think there was one claim that was settled in seconds. It was an automobile accident. It was something they could do quite quickly, technologically. But I also think that it was a bit of a, a marketing Thing that they wanted to say you could get claims management down to minutes. Um, so that sort of is a, a little bit of review 